expressed our gratitude for your willingness to serve in this particular place. By no means need the case to sit on, but you did. Your and our journey into the unspeakable is almost over. Keep in mind that all 11 victims in this case are separate and distinct matters. We're not dealing with a situation where 11 people were killed on one single day in one incident. We are dealing with 11 separate and distinct matters. Now you all took an oath follow the law of Ohio, which sets forth the rules and procedures for dealing with a case of this nature. You just heard the rules and procedures from Judge Ambrose. Whether you agree or disagree with the law is not important took an oath to follow the law, wherever it might lead you to. Mr. Saul was not the first person in Ohio to face the consequences of a case such as this. This type of case in the law that relates to it, contemplates that after a fair and impartial hearing, after a fair and impartial weighing of the evidence, the law seeks to have the punishment fit the crime. The weighing of the aggravating circumstances and the mitigating factors. <coughs> What you have heard during this trial, the evidence that you've heard during this trial, the evidence that relates to the aggravating circumstances that you've heard during this trial amounts to a tremendous assault on your sensibilities. It is the aggravating circumstances that have brought you to this point in the case. If you need to remind yourselves what brought you to this point in the case, all you gotta do is look in this box. The box containing the crime scene photographs, the autopsy protocols. I'm not going to put up any images anymore on the TV, any more graphic images. I'm not going to subject you to any more of that. But if you need to remind yourself how we got here, feel free to look in that box. I don't think that will be necessary. Mitigation. That's what this second phase of the proceedings is basically all about. It offers an opportunity to be fair and impartial toward making a very important decision. We did not rush into this second phase, and this whole second phase has been given an opportunity to present to you in complete fashion, examine the concept of whether and there's any mitigation sufficient enough to warrant against the imposition of the death penalty. 
be mindful of the law <coughs> that the existence of a mitigating circumstance or a factor or mitigating factors of and by itself do not preclude the imposition of the death penalty. It's a weighing process. First, you must identify, find, and identify, and then weigh. The only mitigating factor that is not in complete dispute is that Anthony Sowell from the age of 18 until the age of 25 served in the United States Marines. That's not in dispute. Everything else is in dispute. Whether he suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder is in dispute. Whether he was a victim of child physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse is in dispute. Whether at the time of the offenses he had psychosis not otherwise specified is in dispute. Whether he had obsessive compulsive disorder is in dispute. Whether or not his heart attack broke down his ability to control his desires or of his obsessive compulsive disorder with sexual obsessions is in dispute. Whether or not he had a cognitive disorder not otherwise specified is in dispute. In his unsworn statement, Mr. Sowell stated, well, the only thing I want to say is that I'm sorry. I know that may not sound like much, but I am truly sorry from the bottom of my heart. This is not typical of me. I don't know what happened. I can't explain it. I know it's not a lot, but that's all I can give you. That statement puts the concept of remorse in dispute, and it is in dispute. So these are the things, ladies and gentlemen, when we have disputes that you have to resolve. Now the only thing I said is not in dispute is the fact that he's an ex-Marine. Does that fact outweigh the aggravating circumstance of purposeful, of the purposeful killing of two women, three women, four women, five women? Six women, seven women, eight women, nine women, ten women, eleven women. I will have to uh, re reverse myself on that last objection. I was, uh, the burden of proof is still with the state to prove that the aggravating circumstance outweighs the mitigating factor, not, not vice versa. Just want to correct that. All right. But that's the aggravating circumstance. You decide the weight against the mitigation. At what point is enough is enough? These are 11 distinct matters. That's the reality of what we're dealing with here.
let's look at the aggravating circumstances here. The purposeful killing of 11 women. Christo Dozier. She disappeared in the summer of 2007. Dies of ligature strangulation. I'm talking about pur purposeful death. A cloth tied around her neck. Wrist bound above her head. Ankles with wire cable. Nude from the waist down. The first person, I believe, that was buried in the backyard. And things, and as I said, this was in the summer of 2007. Then things are quiet until a year later, the summer of 2008, <coughs> where Tashana Culver disappeared. She's the one in the crawl space. with her wrist bound, cross space up there in the third floor room. In the latter part of the summer of 2008, we have LaShonda Long. She's the one with the skull in the bottom, in the basement. In the fall of 2008, Michelle Mason died of ligature strangulation from a brown sack tied around her neck, nude from the waist down, buried in the backyard. Second one who was buried in the backyard. Tanya Carmichael, this is interesting, disappeared in November 10th, 2008. Died of ligature strangulation from a black electrical cord tied around her neck, completely nude, buried in the backyard, number three. Uh, disappeared November 10th, and somewhere along this mitigation hearing in these medical records somewhere, you heard on November 11th, there's medical records for Anthony Sowell uh, getting the CAT scan done at a hospital. I remember right, something about being robbed or something like that. November 11th. Then, the next one to go missing is Kim Smith. Takes us in January of 2009. Once again, evidence of wrist and ankles bound with twine, new from the waist down. The fourth person be buried in the backyard. A couple months would go by, which takes us into the middle part of April 2009. We have Amelda Hunter and Nancy Cobbs. And if you remember right, they're very close to one another in terms of dates that they disappeared middle part of April of 2009. Melda Hunter died of ligature strangulation from a shoulder strap from a bag or a briefcase wrapped around her neck, nude from the waist down. The fifth and final body buried in the backyard. 
The next one is Nancy Cox. And she disappeared in the middle of April of 2009. And you heard a little bit from Dr. No about how small the backyard was. And Nancy Cobbs winds up with a ligature around her neck, stuffed in a black plastic bag on the third floor of that house.